Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so we're gonna proceed with the session two. It's called Accountability and Transparency in the Digital Age. And our panelists are Emre Bayamlolu from Tilburg University, uh, myself, Elif Sart from uh, University of California, Berkeley, Sumitha Krishna Prasad, um, Center for Communication Governance, National Law University, Delhi, Claudio Lucena Paravia <laughs> State University, Brazil, FCT Portugal, and Diplo AI Lab, Geneva and Ben Wagner, Vienna University of Economics. Hello everyone, my name is Malavika and I will be the very immoderate moderator of this panel. Um, I almost feel like I should be announcing awards for the Grammys or the Oscars rather than asking people to talk about data protection and privacy given this absolutely gorgeous venue. So thank you to all the organizers um, who've made this possible. Um, I feel a little weird sitting here. I'm gonna sit here. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I've asked our panel, given that when people often hear the word transparency, privacy is not the first thing they think of or they think it's in conflict or that it's somehow these two are having a little bit of a fight and privacy might be losing. So I wanted to ask our panel to kick off with one little sentence and it could be how what they're talking about links to this topic. It could be a horror story about how a failure of privacy resulted in a very bad accountability or transparency issue or any example that they'd like to link these three words together. So I'm going to turn to you first since you're right here. Elif. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a very good question, and as you said, it's in conflict. Um, I would say it really depends on the uh, context, what we're talking about, like if, if we're going to have accountability over transparency or if we need both of them, and if how, like, if so, how. Um, I would say that one example, like horror story, that I think still has effects is Cambridge Analytica. And that was a clear example of how not having transparency ended up really uh, horrible breaches about privacy, and then in, in turn, um, accountability mechanisms were not really uh, in effect. Okay, great. Ben? Thanks, and just to follow on from that and uh, to start the discussion, I'm not sure that the three are necessarily in conflict, but I think privacy is pretty meaningless without transparency or accountability. Like, without those two, we don't have privacy and it's not really helpful. And I would add that transparency as a thing, it's a very nice thing for experts and we love it a lot. But in the real world, when you show people transparent information, they're not able to process it. And so accountability is actually much more crucial than transparency. Okay. Smita? Um, I would agree that you know there's not actually a conflict between privacy, transparency, and accountability. When we, uh, in the context of privacy, when we speak about transparency and accountability, I think it's important to remember that what we really mean is how the people who are using data or uh, who are sort of Im infringing on your privacy are accountable and transparent towards you. And it's not about being transparent in terms of the actual data itself. It's about how they're accountable towards you. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Claudio. Thank you very much, Malavika. Good morning to you all. At morning, afternoon, I'm not sure. <laughs> but thanks for coming. Uh, thanks, Leela and, and Eli, for all the effort in putting this together and for the opportunity to speak with you, uh, to you here. I would say that this is a very interesting exercise to start with. And you asked for a, a, a word, a key word. I would have a key word here to put in the beginning of the conversation. I think transparency and accountability in the realm of privacy has to do with reciprocity mm -hmm. a lot and, and uh, in the, to the extent of the work I'm bringing to you here about always on sensors, uh, a lot of us, of who we are, is already available, but we do not know much about the players who are making this data available and making power, money, and uh, uh, exercising this over the, the, the rest of the society. So I would say it's a little bit about trying to bring some reciprocity to the extent of data that yeah. we already have available. Yeah. And I think all of you have touched on the idea that it's essentially about disparities and power imbalances, fundamentally. Um, so we have Emre yeah, exactly. add to this, and then he'll be the first presenter. 
Thank you. Great. Well, maybe I can start also making some connection with accountability from the perspective that I'm going to present. In a way, this is the perspective on, on GDPR or European Data Protection Regime, because we are going to look into transparency for a purpose, not another transparency for mayor disclosure, but a transparency to see, understand, and scrutinize automated decisions. So many of us came here by, by plane, and some of us are not lucky enough to have other people to do the booking for themselves. So everyone uh, booking a flight, I think, ha had those questions in mind, which emails trigger, which adds, or is my flight price is somehow influenced or compromised with the data I'm providing. For example, maybe you are connecting from a Mac and Macintosh computer, which is an expensive amount, which might mean that maybe you could have higher prices. But looking from this perspective, the transparency conundrum, also this is, we can see that in that sense, transparency and accountability are complacent notions. And at the end, when we're talking about automated decisions, automated data-driven decisions, to give the full generic name. So what we want to know is that we want to know how certain input matches with the output. Well, actually, we are quite familiar with this process, or at least some of us, since we are lawyers in law. How do we do it in law? At the end, we have facts, rules, and the, and the effects answering this process. So this is one of our colleagues, uh, not, a, not, a, not only a lawyer, but a philosopher, Ruben Bins, and he puts it in a very, very concise way. So, okay, so far so good. We need transparency, but that's a very, very vague concept. But we said that we're talking about a specific kind of transparency, a transparency for a purpose. Not, a, not, not transparency, something good on its own, but we have a kind of approach we develop Rather, we could say maybe instrumental. So I'm not going to go every detail of this chart, but basically what, what makes those systems, what make auto, automated decisions intransparent, opaque? Okay, this is a bit complicated as you could see, but there are those systems offer many different kind of intransparencies and opacities, but this is, this is a... This is another lecture's topic. It's just for you to see. But since we are surrounded by those intransparencies, so how are we going to contest the decision? So we can maybe think about a little model, as I have briefly mentioned. Facts. OK. Facts in, 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 in the digital realm, or facts in, in, in terms of uh, software engineering or, or designing systems are very similar to facts in law. Because in law too, there, are, there is no fact just like this computer. For example, there is, a, there is a little lake in front of my house, let's say, but if someone wants to treat it as sea instead of a lake, how are we are going, going to decide whether it is a lake or a sea? Okay, geographers or maybe other people have other ways, but for lawyers, we have rules, we have norms, normativity. We have a rule-based rule -based construction for everything. Oh, this is, the, this is the same when we are doing computing, computer science. At the end, if you're talking about automated decisions or real real, everything is constructed. Facts are also constructed, and therefore sometimes they are not very factual, but just, just constructions. So we have norms, basically we have decisional rules. I'm going to simulate this, don't, don't, don't panic, but for a, for a little, uh, let's say, example, for example, we have an automated health insurance system, so we can take as a fact, or in the computer science machine learning uh, context, we will call those data features, for example, age, height, whatever your, your personal details, this could be called data features, of course they could be much more uh, sophisticated, but at the end we have data features to describe the phenomenon we are going to we are looking at. Then we have decisional rules. For example, in our health insurance system, think about that we are doing data analysis on your browser, and we find out that you are looking for deep fryers. 
which means that you are eating unhealthy. That's a fact. That's a factual, factual determination. It may not be a fact, doesn't matter, just like in law, as long as you can prove it, it's a fact in law. So we have, we have facts, you're eating unhealthy. I don't care right now whether you are or not. This is what you have found out through machine learning and we have norms for that. What is that? You're eating unhealthy, you're going to pay a higher insurance premium. Well, we have a decisional norm and of course we have effects answering this. Sometimes it's only a little rise in your insurance scheme or premium and sometimes maybe it has much wider effects so and the, and the fourth point which we require information or which will in a way complete our transparency scheme is the responsible actors we have to know who is behind those decisions so this is a very very concise and let's say summary of a model how to contest automated decisions so this is we can call a transparency model. Do we have Brent Mittelschat in the audience? Well, I, I, I benefited a lot from, from his paper, but I think he's not here right now. Anyway, we have, to, we have to mention his name. So we can make a very short, let's say, a kind of normative intelligibility or normative transparency definition. So we just need, we have some factual input and we have a result and this result should be verifiable, justifiable, and then, yeah, consequently contestable so that we can, we can comply with Article 22 of the GDPR. Actually, this contestation scheme we're talking about is coming from Article 22. So, okay, a little, a little bit of an example that, that will make things, and that's a very, very familiar topic for people living in Istanbul. After some time, I had, again, a taste of it yesterday, Ronald, Ronald, together with Ronald. Anyway, okay, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to do traffic management through, let's say, for the time being, um, mobile phone data. You can have many different kinds of data to, to work on traffic management. For example, you can have cameras, visual data, but let's suppose that we don't have such kind of data. We only have mobile phone data. But one thing, first of all, in law, we usually have clear set objectives in advance. Either it is done by parliament or whatever, whatever sovereign body. We know the objectives of the regulation. What is the aim? In case of automated decisions, which are perfectly, in many cases, regulatory processes, but first of all, we don't always know the goals of the system. Okay, this traffic management, we are using it, but what is the aim? which is optimizing our travel distance, maybe, but maybe there are subtle, unknown, hidden, and even unintended consequences. For example, there could be, let's say, a notorious company, and for example, they are routing you to show you advertisement throughout the city. Traffic management, you say that you're, you think that you're, they're showing you the shortest route, but actually you're not going on the shortest route. Actually, you are, you are on a special route so that you will see certain advertisement. Or think about that through personal data you have provided to the system. This morning system thinks that you're not really in a hurry, so he keeps you in contact. Oh, oh, he, oh, we personalized them very, okay. The, syst the system, and always he, huh? Always he, they, why, why are they so masculine and dominant? God knows slip of the tongue but it, it tells a lot about the mindset believe me so yeah I exposed myself but at the end yeah there are, there could be goals hidden even unintended so yeah maybe the system thinks that you are not in a hurry keeps you in congestion and lets other others to take priority so there could be numerous and multifarious amount of or aspects of regulatory effects in an automated decision. Some are easily understandable, some are not. And some, even the designers of the system, don't know. So a uh, uh, quick look to our system. So, yeah, we, what we call factual input or future space in computer science, machine learning environment, we, we could call them to a certain extent future space. 
for, for the ease of explanation. So basically we have observations, feedback, and upon this feedback, we, we construct reality or a representation of the world. So coming to our congestion model, the first, first, first representational determination or factual determination we need to know is what is congestion? First we'll define it, then we'll, we'll find out how to detect it. Think about that we are only using smartphone data. Just to give you an idea, your smartphone could have lots of sensors and could provide you many different kind of features, data variables, we could say. And you, first you'll have to decide which of those you will use. And as you can see, this requires a very in-depth understanding of the domain. And what is the domain? Mobile phone usage. This is not an expertise area. They don't teach it in the university. But at the end, you really know this thing deeply. And maybe you can only know after some time by trial and error. Just to give an example, just for a start, if you think five more minutes, you, will, you, can, you can figure out many of those. But first thing is that, OK, looking at congestion, we are looking at maybe the acceler accelerometer, which, which senses the speed movement of the smartphone. But speed is, is relative for, for every vehicle. Well, one initial thing that you have to consider. I'm not going to go further into this, but you can multiply them. But looking at the perspective of our model, let's look at the normativities. Let's look at the decisions that we have to make in this system first. How are we going to define congestion? Are we going to have yes or no? Or are we going to have a, have a scalable outcome, heavy, moderate, light, or, or whatever? Then we may need to know the cause of congestion to make the right decision. Was it an accident, rush hour, or a celebration of events? So this part, these parts deal with finding facts, but not finding, of course. In terms of machine learning, we don't find them we construct them, we create those facts. We'll have to decide and then make a representation of congestion out of data. We'll say, okay, if data is this, 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 this way, then there is congestion. Okay, then we're creating a representation of the world. This is one, one thing you can attack, just, just, like a, just like a legal decision. You can either challenge the determination of facts. No, I'm, I don't have a criminal conviction. Therefore, I should be given passport. Or you can say, OK, I have a criminal conviction, but not giving me the passport is against constitution. So there are various levels of legal challenges. We know them very well, especially we can think about administrative decisions and administrative litigation. We can, we can challenge an administrative decision on many grounds. We can make specific challenges, just saying that I am not that person, or we can also challenge the regulatory framework saying that, OK, this law, this regulation is against the Constitution. So the second part is, is the decisional criteria. OK, if there is an accident, you're going to make a decision. Maybe you're going to slow down, divert, not divert, if rush hour, a different decision. And there are rules for that in the system. But one thing is that those rules could be dynamic. They are not, they are not easily seen. They don't reveal themselves easily. And sometimes there are, there are maybe rules unknown to the designers. Looking at from the GDPR perspective, of course, not all those consequences, OK, what does the system will do? Will divert the traffic? Will make a decision? Some of those decisions, well, let's say, are, are challengeable under GDPR. Some are controversial or not, not so clear. Think about that. Again, our traffic management system, it, it diverts you to a route or it fails to divert to a route because things that you are not in a hurry, but actually you're, you're dying or your wife is just giving a birth, whatever. You suffer some liability. You want to sue them. They, want, they, 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 they diverted you in a way which shouldn't happen, so you incurred liability. That's understandable, and this is actually something challengeable under GDPR because you can think about there is a decision about me. I am subject to a decision. What is that decision? Not taking me out of congestion, leaving me in the heavy traffic. Okay, fine. That's, that's challengeable. But think about that. The system diverts the traffic to, to 
to, let's say, smaller streets to prevent congestion. And at the end, my peaceful flat in this lovely street is now horribly noisy 24-7 because this Google, Apple, whatever traffic management system diverts the traffic to my little quiet peaceful street. Could I challenge this under GDPR? Well, that, that's, 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 a bit, that's a bit questionable because this is not a decision that you are subject to, maybe. This is a decision that you are influenced, but being subject to, because GDPR doesn't say decisions influencing or affecting. It's using the word affect in many places, but when it comes to automated, it say being subject to. So that's, that may be a limitation we can think about. And for the rest of my presentation, okay, then we are going to contest the decision, but what are we going to contest? We talk about this. As I said, you can contest them on individual basis, or you can contest them maybe on regulatory basis, or you can contest them on almost every ground that you can make a legal challenge. You can challenge the accuracy of the data, the calculation, or the normativity. We talked about the normativity. It's diverting or not diverting you. It's, it's the decisional rule. And against whom, of course? Well, OK, if you look at GDPR, we're going to have a human, human in the loop for, for contestation, for, an, for intervention. Well, that's plausible. But maybe we can think about humans maybe could appeal to machines, human to machine contestation. Maybe you can appeal to a machine or you can have a machine for yourself to do the appealing machine to machine, maybe legal challenge. Very quickly, very quickly, very quickly, also trying to be time savvy. All right, we have this, we had the model, norms, facts, effects, automated decisions, but how are we going to implement this? Well, obviously we all know that disclosure, just opening up algorithms, opening up the data is not a solution. It's not a solution for both sides. For the data controller, that exposes them too much. Maybe they have uh, intellectual property concerns, or sometimes there are integrity concerns. Huh? If, if consumers knew how the system worked, maybe they could game or, or, or circumvent the system. So there are many, many constraints in, in terms of making everything open. So we, we have to think a little bit more creative. OK, we talked about this, the conventional transparency, physical access, but I explained it's not a, it's not a solution. There are technical limits. Oh, there is another solution, an alg algorithmic scrutiny or, or audit of those systems. And actually, that might be a much more efficient way of doing it. There are many uh, technical efforts, computer science, machine learning efforts in terms of developing that kind of uh, solutions, tools. And actually, they, they implement as an idea, OK, what are the reasons behind this decision? So they are similar to what we are trying to construct here. And I have, I have written this in more detail. Uh, yeah, yeah, people could, could look at the SSRN page. Thirdly, we have or, or legal protection or data protection or transparency by design. Sometimes we don't need to have too many disclosures, with too many sophisticated systems. Sometimes simple design choices could provide a lot of uh, transparency. For instance, think about drones or uh, video recording drones. Well, you can make a kind of production rule. They should have a blinking light on them when they are recording. A simple design choice, but could solve many, many problems. Yeah. Well, actually, rest well, let's have a look at impediments as well. OK. To implement such a model, either through disclosure, audit, and transparency by design, at the end, the solution needs to be a, a, a fusion of those. And, but we have uh, kind of impediments. One is computation. They are complex. They are probabilistic. In law, you're either this or that, but you're not 70% guilty. Huh? At the end, you're either, you're either committed to crime or not. Of course, we have division of liability, and but basically adaptive. Those systems, systems adapt according to the 
data they encounter, so they are kind of their normativity, their decision-making process is not stable. That's a difficulty in terms of scrutinizing those systems. And we have lawyers, there are legal impediments. Okay, that's an individual right. Think about that. You have, to, you have to contest decisions on an individual level. GDPR do not provide too much room for, for collective enforcement other than certification or dat data impact assessment, but it, it's, this is an individual right. There are always, there could always be IP rights claims. The data controller will say, oh, this is my trade secret, this is my protected software, this is it, this is that. And there is contractual dimension, maybe through freedom of contract, maybe you, you, over, you waive your rights at the end Data control could say, well, there is consent. Well, consent works to a certain extent. If you read carefully Article 22, consent is, is, not, a, is not a lifesaver there. But still, or the data controller say, oh, this is my right to knowledge. I want to do this data analysis because I want to know it. It looks very, very humanly, very, very peaceful. And uh, we talked about machine integrity. We also have economic impediments there. Sometimes the solution is not feasible. And sometimes it's not explaining the decision. Think about that. We have figured out a rule. If pilots speak less than 30 seconds before takeoff, they make 50% less accidents. Wow, flight safety. But why is that? We can't explain. But this is a fact. This, this is proven. So shall we adhere with this rule? though we don't know why it is, could be. But there are certain areas where fundamental rights are at stake, we can't take this approach. We definitely need an explanation. So what I'm trying to say is that not all automated decisions need an explanation according to the model that I have explained here. So what is ahead of GDPR in that sense? We'll have to figure out, actually impact assessments are import, have an important role a kind of risk categorization, risk scaling. What type of automated decisions require solid contestability? They should be contestable as we have explained here. And sometimes maybe we can settle that they are, they are trustable. So this is the most important part. I mean, the, the, the Article 22, the contestation, human in the loop, intervention, they are expressed in a very general and in an abstract way. So the, the work ahead is to find out to what extent to, to enforce this transparency and how to, how to calibrate it, maybe. Ah, finished. That's it. Thank you so much. There's so much to unpack there. Um, really, really wonderful. I'm going to move around because I feel weird sitting there and staring up at this. Um, so many things that I took away from that, and actually it made me feel really nostalgic for many things. One was, I, I'm old enough that I remember a time when we had privacy conferences that didn't involve machine learning and AI, and now most examples come from that field. But I'm also very nostalgic for the future, looking at Emre's model of how traffic congestion can work coming from India, I think that's a future I would love to see and have people make those rational decisions. And if systems and design can function as nudges and aspirations for how a society should live, uh, that's something I would love to see. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, Elif now. Um, actually, what I personally really wanted to do after that talk was to make all of you stand up and adjust all your privacy settings to see all the d data that your mobile phones are sending out. Uh, but given that it usually takes a PhD in settings to be able to do that, you're not going to achieve that today. So Elif is also going to talk to us about AI. So um, I'll be talking about AI and children's rights. Um, and why am I talking about children's rights? So they're the future. Uh, they're going to live in the future that we, um, that we, that the, that the decisions we make today. So 
with AI, with technologies like AI, children will be the most affected by these technologies. And we're talking about robots are taking over our jobs and like we're so worried about those scenarios, but I think we're safe. But those children, the next generations might not be. So it is important to um, talk about children and children's rights. And uh, unfortunately, it's overlooked in general discussions regarding AI. So when we talk about AI's implications for children, I think we can approach it from two directions. The first one is direct effects of AI on children, and the second one is indirect effects of AI on children. And let me walk you through some couple of examples in order to better articulate what I mean by direct and indirect. So my first example is robots using education. I picked this example because uh, this educational robots are heavily invested in, and in the future it seems like they're gonna, they're gonna um, draw more attention in education setting. And when I talk about education setting and learning, I, I would like you to understand it as a general concept. So I'm not just talking about school, I'm also talking about any activity, any place a, children can, a, a child can learn. So it could be learning in a home setting, learning in daycare, and it does not have to be uh, necessarily academic skills, but it also involves social skills. So uh, in order to balance it out, let's talk about pros first. Uh, what educational robots bring um, as pros? So with the applications of machine learning and deep learning methods, educational robots are actually able to personalize learning, which is going to be the, um, scholars believe that, is going to be the focus of next educational um, design. So uh, they're fun, they're creative, they're, they bring interesting ways of learning, which kind of um, hires the participation rates. And then they assist teachers, there are examples of, uh, for example, in Asia, uh, teachers might not be qualified for, let's say, in English, and robots are being actually very useful in terms of teaching English to kids because uh, of the pronunciation and other things as well. Uh, and this all enhance the academic skills of children. Uh, studies show that children uh, raise their collaboration efforts when there was a robot in the education. And um, another thing is improvement of social skills, especially children with disabilities. So uh, MIT actually has a great research on this. Uh, so children with disabilities or ACD is are having more uh, trouble in creating social skills and developing their academic skills. And robots, especially personalized learning embedded robots, could really benefit them. And also it enables remote education. So, cones, what are the cones? Non-inclusive design processes in these technologies are the most of, one of the most important ones in my mind. So, I'm pretty sure you heard of this in a couple of other articles, but engineers, I tend to not include all the stakeholders into design processes. In this case, families, teachers, um, other, other adults around children should be included in the design process. And non-inclusivity not just uh, drives from not having the right stakeholders in a design process, but also having poor data sets. So poor data sets can um, bring discrimination, bias into topic. We talk about these uh, discrimination and bias all over with when it comes to AI, so we can make a correlation here. And another thing is lack of human interaction that is brought by these robots. So children learn a lot from just having a physical connection. Um, and not having this human interaction kind of messes up the children, children's mind. Uh, there's some studies, but I, to my mind, they do not have enough uh, children to test how they're acting, but at least that's, the, um, that's what we have right now. And then the other thing is uh, manipulation and abuse. So children are so vulnerable. They tend to um, just perceive things as they are. And if, 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 we, if to articulate this from a specific example, uh, when we, let's say, uh, children are interacting with robot dogs, and it was seen that um, children were saying, oh, I love you, dog, like, 
you know, it's, it, it, they were basically creating this natural connection with robots and some were struggling, oh, like, is this a living being? How do I act? Like, and some studies also show that children tend to be, uh, tend to become rude because they thought that they just can um, kind of rain commands on them. And then uh, another thing I really want to mention is inequality gap. So who gets these uh, educational robots? Of course, like probably the de uh, already developed countries and underdeveloped or like developing countries will be still, you know, lagging and it will create a uh, better, like a more inequality gap. And then uh, the second example is automated essay grading. Um, I borrowed this from Berkman Klein Center's AI and Human Rights Support, which was published in three weeks ago, I guess. So they talk about pros of uh, having automated essay grading. They say that uh, these systems permit students to engage in more deliberate pr practice of their writing, receiving more feedback on at least some elements of their writing than they would otherwise. So it basically um, enables students to have more feedback and sometimes better feedback when there is not a chance to uh, access to a qualified uh, teacher. So they also stress in the report that having these automated essay grading eliminate bias in grading by removing the opinion of author and the grader. Well, this is debatable. <laughs> And I also put it in a cons because it could be pros and cons, a, a kind of depending on the design. And cons uh, could be grouped into assessments my, may fail to provide the feedback students need for growth and improvement. And then and the second one is they cannot interpret the essays as humans do because these algorithms most of the times kind of assessing, oh, like grammar is good, if the essay is long, then it should be okay. But most of the times writing is more than that. It's about how do you put your ideas in order and uh, being creative and stuff. So my last example of direct effects of AIs, Hello Barbie, this is the first AI toy. And it's so creepy. If you haven't uh, like check it out, I really highly recommend. Uh, so it basically, I'm just gonna jump into cons with this example because I couldn't really see pros, uh, but I'm, I'm sure there are. So it records private conversations of children without parental consent, and consent was mentioned and, um, during today, so I urge you to think about it, what could it mean? And the second is children may disclose private information to smart toys and not be aware of the possible consequences and liabilities. So in, in this case, that private information could be literally anything. It could be, oh, like, my teacher touched me in school, or like, I was, I saw this crime, like, you know, and anything could be uh, under that uh, information. So in this case, does the company have a duty to red flag children who share, let's say, suicidal thoughts or other self-harming behavior? What if the child confides in the toy that he or she is being abused Will the company report this to the relevant authorities? And then what will the company do with that information? So these are like very debatable questions that um, most of the regulations fall short in answering. And the third one is security risks are so high with these AI toys. They're easily hackable. They're being hacked many times. And there was this, um, white hat hacker who was telling like how he was able to hack and, and what he could do with this. So basically he said that, um, yeah, it's a matter of time for me to hack these devices and make them tell whatever I want. So let's talk about indirect effects of AI. So where direct effects of AI on children uh, points to the AI algorithms, machine learning, deep learning technologies that are specifically designed for children this is not specifically designed for children, but still has an um, effect on children. So in this sense, we can think of any, any application that affects parents who has a duty to care children. Whatever happens to the parents is gonna affect children, that's, that's it. And in this case, like we've been uh, reading about these news about especially these topics, so I just wanted to mention. 
And this is not an exhaustive list of examples. So automated loan decisions, automated sentencing, automated job applications, and welfare systems are going to uh, have an effect on children indirectly. So with the examples I gave, uh, these were the rights that uh, came, that were striking to me were at, at stake under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Children. So their right to privacy, we talked this about, uh, talked this in the example of AI toys. Uh, right to education, educational robots fall under this. Right to leisure, again, AI toy. Right to equal treatment, um, you know, educational rob robots could fall under this. And then right to be protected from exploitation and abuse, all of the examples I gave. So I'd like to conclude my words with a couple of recommendations. So AI, AI's implications on children are most of the times overlooked, where it should have been the opposite due to children's vulnerable nature. Therefore, further study on this topic is needed. Second, current international frameworks that protect children's rights do not address most of the issues at stake with the development and usage of AI. Therefore, an update is needed. It's going to be hard, but it's needed. And the last one, accountability, should not be just on one actor. It should be all of the relevant actors that bring the AI to children's life. Um, we, can, we can, I think, um, put more actors in this list, but uh, with the examples I gave, those were the uh, actors that I want to mention. So state actors, what they can do, for example, they can come up with regulatory tools that um, and take effective measures to prevent corporations from doing whatever they want. Uh, and corporations, uh, for example, they can have public facing policies in place and in include relevant stakeholders to design processes. And again, parents are so, so important in this, um, with these applications. So they should be careful about before they bring an IoT device to home and giving their children's privacy away. I didn't mention Amazon Echo's inter, uh, relation with children. So it's another topic, very interesting. I would urge you to, um, I would suggest you to check it out. And the other one is teachers. They should be more conscious about how educational AI tools are being used in school setting. And the last one is researchers. We should um, help addressing these issues even more. Thank you. Thank you, Elif. Um, in one of my other presentations, I had a slide of the Hello Barbie and all the hysteria around it. And you know, it was the new ch toy for Christmas, and you have to put it in everyone's stocking. And the next slide that I had was actually about all the activism and the backlash against it uh, when groups were formed called Hell No Barbie, like Hell No, don't bring this into your home, and don't normalize surveillance with the people that are the most vulnerable. So thank you for bringing that up. And talking about stakeholders, Smita is actually going to take us straight to the regulatory perspective in this field and focus on India, which is getting so much attention right now with you know, on and off attempts to come up with a data protection law and how that is being diluted or how it's being enhanced in recent ways, especially after the new right to privacy judgment. So Smita, all yours. Um, I, I don't have slides. I just thought this would be easier. Thank you. Um, hi. So I think, you know, the discussion so far, we've seen that when we talk about uh, transparency and accountability models in the context of privacy, and especially in the digital age, we look to technology or business or state practices to identify both the problems as well as the solutions for uh, these issues. And my colleagues on the panel have already uh, discussed some of these models, and I'm sure we'll see more discussion on this in other sessions. Uh, but as somebody who does legal research on the right to privacy, on data protection, the first question that this brings to my mind, at least, is where the regulation fits in with these models. And I think more importantly, whether uh, the law, the regulation is prepared for these, uh, the solutions that many of these models pose. Um, 
And this is a question that I find myself coming back to really often, given the kind of progress and discussion that we're having on data protection regulation these days. We've spoken about how in the EU the GDPR has, is now in place and many people across the world are trying to figure out how to comply with it. Um, and in India, like Malvika mentioned, uh, India is a jurisdiction that I primarily focus on and we're still discussing the form that our data protection law should take place. Take, and uh, we have a draft law that's out for public comments and for the past few months we've been discussing extensively what the good and the bad in this law is. And we know that similar discussions are happening in Kenya, Brazil has a new law that's in been put in place recently. Um, so when we look at the actual regulations and the law, right, uh, when we talk about accountability and transparency from this perspective, I think there's two important uh, concepts to look at. First, we have to think about the measures that need to be taken by the data controllers or the processors to ensure that there's greater uh, transparency and accountability in the way that they use our personal information. And secondly, the measures also that need to be put into place to ensure that this law itself is enforced and administered in an effective manner to make sure that the regulatory authorities that enforce these laws are also accountable to us in how they make sure that data controllers and processors are um, implementing the law. So over the next few minutes, I just thought I'd like to walk through some of the proposals that are uh, present in India's draft law and look at how they uh, interact with this, uh, you know, the, the interaction between the regulation and the solutions that we're discussing. So first, look at the obligations of data controllers and processors. Um, so if you look at India's draft law, the draft adopts the very basic premise that we see in the GDPR. Um, that data processors will need to be responsible for complying with the law and also responsible for showing that they have complied with the law. Now, this might seem obvious to many of us in the room, but uh, we have to remember that we, unlike the EU, India has not had any comprehensive data protection law so far. So this is in itself a big step, it's a new step. Um, in addition to this, we also have um, many standard provisions that we see in the GDPR for, that provide for, you know, for notice and consent as the basis for data pr uh, processing and this also works towards uh, keeping data processors accountable to us. But more specifically to the topic, the, the draft uh, devotes an entire chapter to transparency and accountability measures. It starts by mandating the incorporation of privacy by design principles in all uh, of the data processors' practices. It also requires that uh, controllers are transparent about their privacy practices and that they implement security measures that are uh, described by the regulator. And it also talks about the need to notify the data protection authority of personal data breaches. Uh, in addition to this, certain categories of data controllers who are significant by virtue of their size or the number, of, the kind of data that they process are required to maintain records to conduct uh, data impact assessments and data audits. Um, and then these are more standard requirements that we see in, in data protection regulation. But some of the interesting things that you see in the Indian draft law are, um, you know, the concept of a trust score. So these significant data controllers are, who are subject to data audits. Um, once the audit is completed, the auditors are supposed to assign them a rating or a trust score. Uh, the Data Protection Authority will then maintain a, a database, I suppose, of uh, these uh, controllers and also their trust scores so that before you use a service provider, you can go look up their trust scores and decide whether or not you think that they are good enough in their data protection practices. Uh, the other thing that this law introduces is a fiduciary relationship. So it talk, instead of calling your processors or controllers by the words processors and controllers, uh, the law re uh, reverts to this uh, term of data fiduciary and data principle. And the, the justification that they provide is that there is a relationship of trust between um, you know, the data subjects and the data controllers, and that should be reflected in the law. But it's interesting because while they say that this is how it should be, um, it seems like in the, if you look at the actual law, it's just a term that's being used and not necessarily like a concept or a principle that's being imported. Um, so it's interesting, right, because when, when we have all of these accountability and transparency measures that are in the law, you would think that this is a strong law um, that goes very far to protect your data. Uh, but what, what has happened is that the 
the committee that, of experts that put together this law has basically uh, relied on these provisions to dilute many others by saying that we have these accountability measures. Um, so we've also had, like, similar to what the discussions that we had earlier today and that you've seen in the EU and in other countries, we've also had a lot of discussion in India about how having a comprehensive data protection law will be a huge cost to businesses, it will kill innovation, it will kill business, all of these different ideas. And I think a lot of that um, is seen in the way that these provisions of the law have been diluted uh, by saying that, you know, the accountability measures exist. So, for example, uh, we spoke about the right to object to uh, processing and particularly the right to object to automated processing just now. Uh, if you look at the way the committee of experts has dealt with this in India, they've just said that they've waved off the need to really discuss this and see whether we need it in Indian law by just saying that uh, this is something that privacy by design will take care of. If you implement privacy by design properly, then uh, this will be taken care of. You won't have any issues and you don't need a right specifically for this. But if you look at what the law says in terms of what privacy by design really constitutes, it has, there's no reflection of these issues in that uh, description, right? Uh, the other thing is for, um, that a lot of the obligations that you would normally expect the data controllers or the data processors to take care of have been moved to the data protection authority. Uh, so, for example, the data breach notifications, the, the data controllers need to just notify the, the authority of this and then they decide whether or not it's, it's something that comes to you as a user. So you don't automatically get to know if your data has been breached. It's up, up to the authority and, you know, subject to the regulatory burden that's placed on them. And I think this brings me to the second concept in transparency and accountability, which is the obligations of the data protection authority itself, right? Um, so this is, of course, a larger issue of governance um, and not very specific to privacy or data protection. We're talking about the capacity of the state, of, uh, the, of regulatory authorities to really uh, engage on a particular subject. But it's, I think, a little more, it's really important in this context when we're talking about privacy in the digital age for a regulatory authority uh, which is dealing so much with very quick changing technology and this growing tech industry to be capable to uh, work quickly, to regulate quickly, and also to be accountable uh, for these actions so that we're able to see whether or not they're keeping up with what's happening, right? Uh, and on this issue, I think the Indian draft law is quite weak. Uh, it gives the authority a lot of responsibility and doesn't really give us much insight into how they would actually function. We don't really know what they would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, so I won't go into more detail on this now. Uh, but the reason I brought this up was because, you know, this takes us back to the question that I had when, we, when I started, the intersection between regulation and these tech, technology or business-based solutions for ensuring that there is transparency and accountability uh, when we talk about data protection. So I think it's important to remember that if we want to ensure that we have the best protection for data, um, for personal information, we need to have a combination of both. But then if you have a, um, it, then it would depend upon how the law is actually drafted. So we've, a lot of us here are supporters of regulation of data processing, and we've moved beyond this conversation about whether a data protection law is prescriptive or, or overly paternalistic. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we stick to a law that's very rigid in its uh, form, right? We need to keep in mind that technology changes and grows much faster than law does, and that this is not just a problem, but can also be harnessed to ensure that we have better data protection. This technology can be used to improve data protection, not just to improve data use. Um, so I think for that, we need to remember that uh, these data protection laws that we, we're talking about, whether it's in the EU, whether it's in India or any other country, um, should be the floor and not the ceiling when it comes to data protection. And we should make sure that the regulation itself uh, kind of enables this, reflects this idea, and allows for adoption of all of these technologies and these solutions that we've been talking about. So, yeah. Thank you, Smita. Thank you, Smita. Uh, that was super helpful. Um, recently at a 
I was at an AI workshop and one of the regulators and actually one of the government people in the room coming to your capacity point actually said that we shouldn't actually try and protect data at all in a place like India because he said the one resource that we have is data. We, given the population size, the one thing that exists that we can actually compete on relative to other countries is the volume of data that we can produce. So actually trying to protect people's data was the worst thing that a country like India could do or by extension any developing country. So if that's the sort of mindset, you can see why this regulation is the way it is. Um, Claudio is going to speak next, uh, who straddles Brazil and Geneva. So I'd <laughs> love to hear your perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, this has been tricky, huh? We're running out of interesting topics in this. <laughs> but I guess I might bring you something uh, uh, from a different approach, at least here. You, all right. So here we are. Uh, I'm currently uh, connected to EFS, the Foundation for Science and Technology in Portugal and the Catholic University, where we're working on a larger, my PhD uh, pro project encompasses AI and law enforcement. Uh, as a spin-off, we're taking a look at a very specific kind of sensors, which, are, uh, which we happen to call it always on. And this functioned as a spin-off for a side project that uh, we developed over the course of the past year with the University of Haifa in Israel, taking a look exactly at these devices here, which we call always on. So a brief agenda of what we're going to do here in this, in, in this discussion, a brief introduction the policy issues and the legal environment in which this is taking place and a couple of conclusions for the sake of recommendation, right? So the context is artificial intelligence and law. To be more specific, this is the scope of the project we're addressing in Portugal. We're trying to devise a legal framework to allow us to assess the adoption, the implementation, and the monitoring of technologies of, or measures that incorporate some degree of automation. Uh, we're doing this in a way that is not, I would say, monolithic, addressing one and only one dimension. We're instead taking a look at a three-dimensional approach. We're calling it informational structural elements. They're data, they're algorithms, and they're sensors. Uh, for the data, I think it's, this is the dimension we've been talking most about uh, during the day here. It's, the regulation is fairly explored. A second dimension of algorithms is uh, one about which a huge debate over transparency, accountability, I would add explainability, but also governance dimensions are, are, being, are being the object of strong discussions in the past years. And I, I would rate this four terms in, uh, the four terminologies in terms of evolution. We talk about transparency first, then we discover inconveniences, then we talk about accountability, start talking about explainability due to a legal uh, uh, determination from the GDPR, but the, the word governance seems a little bit more adequate to me. But about sensors, we still have a largely unregulated environment. And they're very important because there is a, also a buzz about in the Internet of Things. It has also been in the stage for some time, and I'm using this expression for the last time in this presentation, because here's the thing. The things in the Internet of Things are not things at all. They're sensors. And it makes a difference to call them sensors. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not an activist. I work for a university. So my job is to research, try to state facts, draw conclusions that can be inferred, re reasonably inferred from the facts. Uh, I, I do not oppose to the arguments and to the tone of activists that can be scary, but it's part of the game of developing new policies. It's not my case here, so I'm not trying to convey by any means that these advancements that come from sensors for the large network of sensors that is available now shouldn't be incorporated in our daily lives. But I am worried about the fact that the impact of these sensors, the impact that they cause now in our lives, that it changes our life, it makes our life different than it was 10 years ago when this network of sensors was not there. What are, the, what are we using these sensors for? Is it a TV that records or interprets commands, voice commands? Is it, as Emre said, uh, do you, does it have to do with health monitoring? Uh, what else? Does it have to do with the decision 
of a vehicle, of an unmanned vehicle, to take away, to engage, select and engage a target without any consultation to a human being? Because we're talking here about three very different categories of sensors with very different objectives that should be subject to different amounts of transparency and accountability. That's what I'm, all I'm saying here. Uh, to bring back the realm of uh, health, a couple of weeks ago, uh, yes, September 19th, we had an announcement that John Hancock, one of the lar uh, longest standing insurance companies in the United States, were implementing the very same controls that Emery was talking about, just it was discontinuing, ending its regular policies. You want to you hire an insurance? You have to be submitted or subject to what they now call interactive policies. It means you will have to monitor, constantly monitor and share with them your personal data. There might be a commercial, fair commercial, legitimate commercial interest in that. That is debatable. It's not what I'm questioning right here. I'm saying that the time to discuss the use of this census from a regulatory perspective is more than, uh, it's, it's more than time now. So uh, what do we call exactly? The, the definition is still a little blurred, but for this always on sensors, we're referring to them for now at devices that are uh, designed to constantly collect and transmit data. We usually, this data usually of a sensitive nature and there is a degree of pervasiveness in the, in the uh, presence of these sensors in our daily lives. Uh, we're going to take a look at what's going on in this sense, the policy, legal, uh, uh, policy and legal developments. Uh, this work, as I said, is a spin-off, a smaller project from a bigger one. Uh, we're taking a comparative look into perspective in the United States, in the European Union, and Brazil, which is the legislation, the jurisdiction where I'm, I'm coming from. Uh, a couple of uh, examples of what's going on. I mentioned the Samsung TV that we used to hear or interpret comments. And once again, my focus here is not on the content, what they are uh, able to do, but on how transparency and accountable, how much do they disclose of what they're going to do with this information. If you take a look here, uh, uh, Samsung reasonably says what they're going to do with your voice, transmitting, including device identifiers to a third party. Interesting, they, they uh, communicate the party they are transferring the data to. This is also a very positive uh, feature. They can collect for, uh, to improve their services and, I mean, this is, the, this is the general policy. I usually update these policies, if possible, minutes before uh, the talk. I just happened to have just arrived in, in Istanbul a couple of hours ago, so this very recent update was not possible anymore. So this is uh, what Samsung has been doing. Elif re uh, recalled us of the Barbie. Uh, the, my example is the one of Kayla, which is a, a, a doll that was hacked a couple of times on stage during various presentations, including the EPDP last year. Uh, it, she has touched upon everything. My, my idea, again, is to take, try to take a look at the policies, at how transparent the, the manufacturers are in this sense. Uh, from the first time we started looking, which was uh, October last year, uh, this general policy was online with a click here option for you to go into deeper detail. This click here option used to take us to this next page. But a couple of times after we presented in, before summer, I think, uh, the company took us to this page here, which is uh, fairly updated. Uh, probably not uh, in, to the GPR, GDPR terms. When I talk to you about not, not being scary in the discourse, I find it very important to bring you also reasonable, legitimate, and also beneficial uses of sensors. It is the case, for example, for, for this paper that takes a look at sensors that monitors falls uh, concerning old people. So this, these sensors are, are used for a very, of course, they have their, their, their uh, disadvantages also. The, the treatment and the processing has always uh, to be conducted very carefully. But this is a very positive use with, along with many others uh, of these technologies. And then the core of our work itself, which are the personal assistants that, uh, that are always on, collect and transmit data, our pervasiveness and collect sensitive data is the, is the object of our uh, most uh, in-depth analysis, I would say. There also is a reasonable explanation on what they are doing with the, with, with the data. 
Uh, this part specifically here of the report talks about how they deal with the court orders so that they can uh, provide data uh, according to court orders. There is usually from, the, from both manufacturers a, a disclosure that they will try to avoid this handling if the reasons are not solid enough, but then there's always the disclaimer that unless otherwise uh, required by applicable law. This is the one from Alexa, this is one from Google Turb. Uh, from Google Home with a recent update. This is pretty much the way they take, they uh, deal with a court order uh, request. They also disclose it for, to enforce terms of service, detect technical issues, uh, fraud security or technical issues, and protect against the harm to the rights, property or safety. I mean, they have a, a fairly comprehensive list of uh, circumstances in which they would uh, make it relev uh, relative uh, privacy rights. This, this is just to uh, show that this the data produced by this uh, personal assistant have already been requested by courts as the sole witness of a crime. This case was dismissed because there was, a, the, the, there was another uh, end for this case, but the, the situation remains and we're going to see in the future once again. Not the latest uh, uh, update. Yesterday, if you're following the AI initiative, uh, we, we heard, uh, and it's published on Telegraph, that the latest patent that Amazon is filing is the one designed to sense your moods, not by asking, not by being informed, but by monitoring, for example, signs just as exactly coughs so that it would recognize uh, if you are sick at, uh, from the description, from the allegedly description. This is news from during the time I was flying, so I didn't have time to double check it. But from the description, it's, it, it seems that it first uh, proposes you or suggests you a home solution or medicine or a tea or something. But after that, it starts offering you uh, medicine and buys it automatically for you. So in the end, what we're going to have in this paper, we're going to have a, uh, an approach from three different dimensions. One from cybersecurity, which is going to encompass, in the case of, of the United States, how this environment behaves in, uh, for healthcare organizations, financial institutions, and federal agencies. Uh, um, many of the speakers have already mentioned the fact that the United States, I wouldn't say, I'm not a native speaker, so I, when, you, when, you, when you mention comprehensive uh, framework, I, I usually read it as a systematic general framework. I mean, all together in one le piece of legislation, it is, it is the case uh, that we have now in Brazil. It, uh, uh, it's not the case in the US. It's a m more divided uh, framework. Also from the perspective of uh, cybersecurity, the NIS directive is, is our object of, uh, of analysis for this comparison. And for Brazil, we do not ha currently have a specific framework for this, although we have been discussing uh, a general strategy for the Internet of Things. And here I'm using the expression once again, although I oppose to it. Uh, from the data protection perspective specifically, once again, we have a, a divided approach in the United States concerning uh, personal identifiable information, and then for different segments, we're going to have different sources for this law uh, in the EU now, uh, the GDPR, with the necessity to read or reread or design and implement concepts, that, uh, concepts as the new idea of concept, privacy by design, uh, automated decisions, which we touched here, legal basis, and a series of other, of other uh, concepts. And from the perspective of Brazil, as of August, 15th, is it right? August 15th, we have also a co what we call a comprehensive, I would say a systematic body of law concerning uh, data protection, August to 2018, to come into force on February 2020. And from the perspective of the consumer protection, we're going to compare, again, from the United States, uh, norms and regulations from different organisms, from the uh, European Union, Electronic Commerce Directive, not only, but mainly, and from Brazil, what have been laid down, what has been laid down by the consumer codes and the, act, and the acting and the performance of some special commissions at district attorneys. This is not to mention uh, another approach, which has been also touched upon, which is a human rights approach at ICANN, 
and the new uh, non-commercial users constituency, which, is, which I happen to be a member of. We're discussing this is by no means the only instance in the world where human rights impact assessments are being discussed, but we are uh, formulating one uh, human rights impact assessment, which is very similar in structure to a privacy impact assessment, which is demanded by GDPR. We're working this for the broader domain of human rights. It's also another trend that can go on. So to finish, what's next? Well, the comparison is not yet uh, definitively made. We have to have some adjustments, but it's enough to understand and to see that the lack of definitions and the competent national authorities isn't an obstacle for that, uh, so as to help us govern and uh, face the regulatory challenges. Concerning AI specifically, which is very much connected with the use of these sensors, uh, uh, Professor Uzgaso from the Berkman Klein Center, who was supposed to be uh, here, uh, when he opened the, the specific project, the AI initiative in, at Berkman Klein, he opened with, with a blog post that uh, laid down very interesting guidelines on how uh, regulatory, uh, how we should look at this from a perspective of internet society regulation, the normative aspects. It's not the only text, but it is a very comprehensive and concise text in, in, in very easy and plain language. I think this is one of our challenges now. We're introducing a new dimension, new elements in the discussion of regulatory issues, and we need comprehensive, informative texts, and this is one, one of them that are very uh, comprehensive and informative. As final recommendations, we can see from the comparison that we make that uh, consent, although not the only, but a, a very important basis for processing, uh, the transparency in its requests should be an improvement that we, we could be seeking here. We do not have the illusion anymore that individuals will ever be in full control, in absolute control of their data. But then coming back to what I said in the beginning in the, from the provocation of, of Malavika, this is about reciprocity. There must be some point, some extent to which we still have some control of our data. I think this is putting the citizen or the user, the consumer, I'm, I'm falling short of the category here, the individual. This is about putting the individual back into the loop of the chain of performances or chain of processing in his data. We will not have full control anymore, but I think it's not just fair from a regulatory perspective that the individual is absolutely out of the control. And this is one of the efforts around data protection initiatives. Some other thing that we have been observing is that for court orders that need to be performed upon the requisition and the use of personal data, we should observe minimally internationally recognized standards for the uh, delivering of this data. And uh, while we do not have comprehensive and systematic cybersecurity legally binding professions, uh, legally binding provisions, sorry, it is convenient and recommended that uh, uh, manufacturers adhere to industry standards that are available from a technical perspective all over. So this is pretty much what I had to offer you for today. Thank you very much for the patience and for the attention. Thank you, Claudio. I'll swap you a chair for the mic. Thank you. Um, so we have Ben Wagner last, and I'm already queuing you all up to prepare questions to throw at all of these wonderful speakers once Ben is done, because we want to keep this as interactive as possible. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing this fantastic event. It's really great to see so many people uh, sitting here listening to us talking about privacy, accountability, and issues related to it. Um, it's really quite special. And it's also special to be able to say this. Um, OK, I'll try and work out what full screen means in Turkish. Can you put this in full screen? Okay, thanks. So it's great to see so many people here, 
and I'll be talking briefly now about software accountability mechanisms, and we'll be hearing a little bit more from a technical perspective and less specifically from a legal perspective. You heard now about legal regulation, about regulatory approaches, about many different things related to this, and I'd like to take a slightly different approach and also involve the audience in getting to understand this, because I think it's important that we get your knowledge up onto stage and we don't just talk about what I have to tell you. So, if you're going to a new place somewhere in Istanbul, wherever it is, whether you're from Istanbul or not, it doesn't matter. What's the best route? How many minutes does it, get to t t does it take for you to get there? And how do you know? And in order to answer that question, if you have a smartphone or a device, you can go to the website menti.com, enter the code 75002, and answer the question. How do you know? You don't just have to take pictures of it. You can actually use your phone and a link, and you can answer the question based on any of these options. You would ask your friends. You would use a phone. You'd use a paper map. You'd use the navigation system in your car or some other option. How would you get to a place in Istanbul that is brand new to you, that you've never been to before? How would you find your way to get there? OK, some people asking their friends. Some people, oh, wow, paper maps. This is the first time I've met somebody using a paper map. Thank you. It never happens. I've done this presentation now four times. Nobody ever says paper map, so thank you, paper map. Oh, two people, please. It's much appreciated. And friends are here, too. So normally when I do this almost exclusively and here, too, I'm afraid people say they use their phones. Is everybody more or less finished, or do you need a little bit more time? Ah, still going up. So as you can see, the majority of people are using their phone. By far. OK. Let's try the next question. So most people, there are some people with cars and navigation systems. That's fantastic. And some people will use paper maps. But if we want to know how to get to a new place, first and foremost, we will use our phones. So next question. Assume now that you're meeting friends in the Vault Hotel in Karakoy. What's the fastest way to get there from here? And I'd like you to answer this question just without checking on any map navigation system. Just say intuitively. If you don't know where it is, that's fine. Just guess, based on your knowledge of Istanbul currently, how you would get to the Vault Hotel in Karakoy right now. What would be your intuitive guess on what the fastest way is to get there? You have the same options as you previously suggested. Any guesses? What do you intuitively think, without using mapping software, without using any programs, just assuming based on no technological use, of course, apart from answering the survey, how would you get there? Bike. Oh, we have lots of answers. Thank you. But they're not showing for some reason. So let's see. There we go. By public transport is the fastest answer, by far, for everybody here in the room. By taxi, some people think. By car, by bike. Fantastic. So. If you're based in Istanbul, this is what you think is the fastest way to get to the Vault Hotel by public transport. Now, the next question, how do you know that there's the fastest way to get there? Here again, you can just enter a word, any word. How do you know that the fastest way to get there is? Where does the knowledge come from that you have this understanding? Just type it in. Don't have to tell me. Type it into. The, oh, there we go. Intuition, experience, bus, practice, fantastic guess, Google Maps, perfect just to give me an idea of how you know what the best way is to get there. And in the process of doing it, you're participating in a live academic research project. So thank you very much. It's very helpful. And the last one, and this one gets a little bit more complicated, I'd now like to ask you specifically to get to the Vault Hotel in Karakoy. How long exactly does it take? And in order to answer this question now, please use Google Maps. So use Google Maps to help you. And then based on the estimate that you receive from Google Maps, tell me how long does it take you to get by car, by public transport, by bike, and by taxi to the Vault Hotel. I could have picked anything. It's just a, somewhere that is relatively close by, but not too far, so we can have a conversation about how long you think it takes to get there by public transport, by car, by bike, and by taxi. And of course, it takes a little bit longer this time, because you need to look at your Google Maps first and sort of guess based on that how long it's going to take.
I should add while I'm saying this, thank you so much for being part of this experiment, because so far I've never done this uh, outside of Germany and Austria, so we now have an additional data set, and I think it's going to be fascinating. Specifically because, once everybody's finished, you need a few more minutes, okay? Pardon? A tiny bit. And so just to pause now briefly so that everybody's finished, you are all off a bit. And the reason that you are all off a bit, okay, people are still entering, fantastic, thank you very much. The reason you are off a bit, all of you, is because you're using a biased information system. You don't see the biases, you don't know the biases, but you still trust the system. You're used to using Google Maps. Remember when I asked you intuitively, what's the fastest way to get there? Everybody says public transport is the fastest. Now, after you've looked at Google Maps, cars are faster than public transport. And the reason for that is not that cars, especially in Istanbul, seriously, are actually faster than public transport. It's that Google Maps makes them look faster than public transport. So. The problem is that we're talking here about perceptions of geographic reality that we are only able to look at and understand by using technical tools. If I ask you whether something is far or not in Istanbul, the answer will probably be looking at your phone to work out, does it take half an hour, does it take an hour? Distance and time merge into one, and the recommendation that you get is the recommendation from Google Maps. Typically, it's the most used platform. At the same time, we know from all of the research that we have on paper maps, thank you to the people who are using them, that paper maps are already incredibly biased. So why should digital maps be any different? And why should we as users trust them? There's beautiful quotes here. Give me a map, then let me see how much is left for me to conquer of all of the world. There's no such thing as a perfect map. And online mapping services threaten to change the way we perceive geographic reality. This is what just happened to you. This is what happens every day when you use Google Maps. And the problem is this source of power is not accountable to its users, to you who are using it, because there's a very specific bias in Google Maps. And the bias is related to this pseudo comparison. When you open Google Maps and when you check for different things, you are suggested that each of these bars is somehow comparable. So you have, for example, 29 minutes for a car, 49 minutes for public transport, two hours for walking, and so on. Now, the problem is that the algorithms used to construct these numbers are different. That means that they're considering factors in one of these contexts and in the different contexts that are not the same. So it's as if a student was to make an essay on one topic, which you would use certain ingredients involved in to make this essay. Then you would use a completely different essay on another topic with a completely different set of ingredients. And then you would try and compare the two. They are obviously incomparable. You cannot compare them. So for example, the assumption that Google Maps has access to all relevant data is not true. The comparison of representation is not true. That you have immediate access to a car when you start moving here is not true. And a long list of other things, we find nine different biases in total when we started looking at the software in greater detail. Now, the effect that this has, if you go back to the example that we had before, is that you now all think that public transport is slightly slower than it actually is, and that cars are slightly faster than they actually are. The bias is a pro-driving bias. It leads you to believe that it's a good idea to drive, and this has an effect on human behavior. So this is the effect that when we did this with a study on uh, 500 users where we modified Google Maps. At the beginning, intuitively, exactly what happened to you as well, you think driving is probably not a good option, so you wouldn't drive. That's the little blue bar right at the front. Then you read Google Maps, and suddenly driving seems to be a plausible option. We then introduce a warning label to provide transparency to inform users about the problem with Google Maps. People are even more likely to drive, because why would you want to be warned about something anyway? As why I say in the previous introduction, transparency isn't very helpful. And if anything, it can be counterproductive. And then only once you correct the software, once you provide accountability to the users, you tell them the actual estimate. In this case, we estimate that simply by walking the route ourselves, by driving it ourselves, and then providing this estimate in Google Maps rather than the error of the algorithm. And suddenly, users are almost back to where they were before they even used the technology. 
What that tells you is that if we had accountable information systems, as human beings, we would make better decisions. What it tells you is that the way the systems are set up right now do not provide that, and that we're in the weird situation where with a lot of information systems, with a lot of technical systems we use, we actually make better decisions without using them. Just let that think in for a second, what it actually means. You're better deciding how to get somewhere in Istanbul without looking at your phone. The reason for that is that the system is not accountable to you. And so what we've tried to develop is to understand the concept not of legal liability, not of all of the things that you've heard so far in a regulatory sense, but how could you make that system more accountable to the user in a very simple sense. And the issue is, first of all, we're not talking here about trust and trusting your software, because honestly, at this point, we need to assume based on everything you've seen in the last few years, be it about Facebook, be it about Google, be it about many other forms of software, it's very difficult to trust software. And if we're honest, trust is not a reasonable thing for users. Trust should not be the dimension that you should assume as a relevant factor for the user. Instead, there's an adversarial relationship between the provider of software and the user. The provider has all of the data about you, it knows what you're doing, and it nudges you and manipulates you in different directions. So there is no good reason for trust in this relationship. And instead, you would at best need to be able to accurately assess the recommendations you get from software and to be able to judge whether those are good or bad recommendations. In order to be able to do that, a user needs additional information than what they currently have. You can't remember Google Maps gave you a bad recommendation last week, last month, last year, and so you need support in doing that. You shouldn't need to a law degree or to be able to learn to code in order to do that. To be accountable also means in that context that you should have the ability to understand what your software is doing and the recommendations it's giving to you without having some fantastic technical training. Anybody should be able to do it. So this is, gets a bit technical, so I'm going to skip over it here. But basically, the idea is that you need to collect the data, the recommendations that you get, and then ensure that the user has access to them over time. So what that means in a concrete context, and we built a little bot that does this, which is basically to say, last time when you got a recommendation from Google, there was a 24 minutes error in that recommendation. You should consider that in future when you get a recommendation from Google so you know what your individual bias is. And that individual bias is very different from what maybe a regulator would choose, what Google would choose, or what your neighbor would choose, because it's different for every human being. You use transport differently, you walk faster, you walk slower, you have a car, you don't, all of these things. So as a result, the challenge is how do you ensure that we can get this type of information to consumers? This is a very simple, small example of what it might look like for one very specific software product, but it's also a very powerful one. Because when we're talking about the idea of accountability mechanisms, you can provide better predictions. You can provide for privacy and privacy-enhancing mechanisms despite the fact that you still need to improve Google software, but you then have better control over the data because there's a cutoff in between. Users are able to learn about the biases that are in the systems already, and there's also a mechanism for collective learning. So it's not that Google software cannot also be improved, but that the user chooses which information they share with them. System learning, of course, is still possible, but there's actual external accountability, which for me is critical. We're talking a lot right now about accountability mechanisms and accountability of information systems that are based on ethics. And I'm sorry to say, if they're based on internal ethics boards of private corporations, there aren't strong incentives to create that. So unless we're talking about meaningful external accountability that exists outside of the organizations that are creating the software, then we're not talking about accountability, we're talking about nice conversations. And so here, the GDPR and other mechanisms can contribute to this considerably, but it still rests on an ability to have accountability that goes outside of the organization, that isn't just with a organization itself, but that goes beyond that and is accountable to the user. That's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ben. One quick question before we open it up. Did you find the same issue with things like OpenStreetMaps, which are more collective and user-generated? So the depressing thing is that Google Maps was the first product of this kind, and so you find similar biases in almost all mapping tools. Google Maps has some of the strongest ones, and if you were very cynical about the business model, you could argue that they have a strong incentive to get you to drive, because then they can convince you that it's a good idea to take a taxi, 
and they would then ensure that they can get themselves a commission when you take a taxi, or that you take an Uber or a Lyft or any of the other things. So there's a strong economic incentive for this bias. The question is, of course, why do all of the operators that don't have this economic incentive, like OpenStreetMap, have this? And I think the answer to this is that once you become the default, everybody wants to copy you. And if you're not aware of the biases, you can't get rid of them. Thank you. Um, can I just check with one of the organizers how many minutes we have left? I know we're running late. So maybe we'll take three questions, because I know we're already behind. So the lady here, and shall I just line up people? Anyone else? There, yeah. And here, OK, three. Please. My question is very small and for all of you. Are you closing your webcams with bandage, or are your webcams are open? Are you afraid of the technology? of you or not? Who has band-aids on their webcams? <laughs> Show of hands, how many of you cover your webcam? I do. All of you. Thank you. All of us. Okay, thank you. Sure. The lady here? I should wear my glasses before saying it's a lady. I can't see properly. It is. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Darman. Let me to introduce myself first. I'm a software engineer and I'm CRM specialized. I worked on statistic. I have mathematical background and I also work in data mining. When Mr. Emre was talking about the normative nature of uh, law, I was thinking about language. And let me to say why I thought about this. The first thing that I wanted to do is uh, was, but, 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 I was trying to say uh, the rules and the decisions which are made by artificial intelligence are also clear for me because I was seeing the mathematical background. Then I came to the point when he was also presenting the probabilistic nature of all these algorithms. But probabilistic nature are also, um, is also the basis of science because when we test hypothesis, we test with statistics. Then it comes to the point uh, where I was really sh um, curious about what is the difference between the methodology which is used by law, which was different, which was making you uh, to say that it's not that clear, the rules are not that clear, which are pointed out. The second thing, uh, I would like to say is I'm very happy to see Asian side of uh, the science. Um, first it was Korean and then now Indians that are here. Uh, because I strongly believe that new approach to the science is going to come from the east part of the world. I don't know how it's going to come technologically and the mindset also is going to be different. Something additional and surprising is going to come. I don't know what it is. I just know from musical side, um, there are also patterns, and I see, I see all the world with patterns. And the language which makes me to see all these things with the percussions, with the dances, with the linguistic nature is mathematic. I don't know how it does, but it helps me to see the world clear, not as sure as maybe low, but with probabilistic nature, very probable. And the last point is IT. When all these regulations are talked, I see one point, especially in Turkey, uh, that we don't have enough IT specialized uh, people working on IT security. It's getting worse. Maybe you will see the results soon because the companies, I don't believe that they, uh, they really clearly say how many attacks they had, how much it costed, because some are paid by insurances, so they try to not to uh, divulgate all these problems, but it's going to get worse, and I hope love by nature, which is combining different disciplines, like psychology, like psychology, and science, is going to give the answer or force people to uh, act on this. Thank you. Thank you. Emery, did you want to comment? 
Well, uh, this was uh, hardly a question, more like a small presentation of, on, of its own. And actually, you touched all the weak points of my argument. But uh, one thing, probabilistic or probable thinking is science, true, but there are, there are many concerns or setbacks about its epistemological nature, whether, whether it, is, it is a good device to explain cause and effect relations, that's one thing. Secondly, coming to more concrete, okay, that was not something I wanted, I, 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 I went into my presentation, but okay. One thing, we talked about facts and norms. Speaking about facts, law is, let's say, more permissible, uh, sort of uh, probabilistic thinking. Sometimes, yes, a 70% representation could pass, but at the end, in law, we have uh, beyond reasonable doubt, you can you can you can think this in a, maybe in a probabilistic way. But but once again, there's huge amount of literature about the uh, truth quality, let's say, of probabilistic thinking. It's not it's not a science of truth. It's it's a science of a, a part of or a glimpse of a truth. But yes, in law, sometimes we we use probabilistic reasoning to decide for certain facts. But however. When it comes to rules, this is hardly the case in law. Uh, our norms, uh, we expect them to be more stable. For example, in an automated decision system, thresholds could change, parameters could change dynamically, and actually this could result as, as a uh, change in the, in the decision norms we are employing. Okay. In law, sometimes, to a certain extent, exceptionally, we permit that. But actually, probabilistic thinking of norms is, is quite anathema to law in that sense. When it comes to facts, I am leaving a, a leeway for that. Sometimes, law can accept probabilistic calculation of facts. But, but coming to norms, that's a really difficult playground. If you're, if you're going to think of contesting those systems on normative grounds, we will have to have a a certain stable understanding of the normative setup. Thank you. But one other thing, I'm neither a mathematician nor an expert on statistics or computer science. I'm a lawyer and I'm trying to learn those domains as much as I can. So although I can give you an answer, I'm not in a position to, 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 to support or elaborate on that based on those disciplines. So those are weak points in my model and we, which, which needs more feedback from other disciplines. That's, that's for sure. The feedback from other disciplines is sitting right here. Yeah. So, um, no, I think to add on to what you've said, I think the, it seems like a relatively theoretical conflict when you're talking about the tension between norms and facts. And so to make it a bit more concrete, I think the, the example that we was just presented as well now where we're talking about Google Maps makes it very concrete. Because yes, of course, Statistics is also the language of science, but the question is how do you then represent that science of your algorithm and the choices that you make? It doesn't say on the Google Maps recommendation that you get 37 minutes approximately or with a, like a, a wavy line to as an estimate. It doesn't say 35 to 40 minutes to indicate there might be some error. It doesn't even give you a confidence interval if you were talking like a proper scientific description from statistical side. So you're telling the user that you claim to have a fact and there's a norm behind it, which is we have all of the data, and therefore you can assume that we are trustworthy, when neither of these is true. And so you're putting the user in a position where they make assumptions about you because of the way you've designed the product based on pseudo facts that aren't actually facts. And this is the classic example of bias, where we can then have a conversation about good or bad statistics, but how science is represented is very clear and it's not adequate for the user to be able to understand what's going on, as you all saw, because the, your estimates were biased, like everybody else's, because you're human, and that's a normal thing. That's a much better answer to this question. Thank you. <laughs> what I mean. Help from other disciplines. Uh, there was a lady here in the corner, and then KS, and we'll close with KS can have the last word. Can we get a map, uh, mic to you? Yeah. You want to get her a map already? Yeah, I want to get her a map, because clearly please. the ones we have are flawed. Hello, uh, it's Denise. Uh, it was already mentioned how um, the um, algorithms can be um, biased and um, 
that also uh, mostly represents the way our societies are structured. We have like, discrimination and um, some bias that we have. And um, so there's an ongoing discussion that we are also putting these in these algorithms that the input data, the inferred data, or the um, teams who are working and uh, developing these um, decision-making processes can be um, without knowing and wishing uh, biased or um, because like we don't apply uh, many rules that we have to the inferred data. There's like um, things happening in these black boxes can uh, lead to um, expanding the amount of discrimination that we have in the society. And we were talking about how um, consent can, is not anymore a concept for um, an, any user uh, because um, ex mm, the explainability of these systems are very um, um, hard for anyone to get it. Um, so we need accountability and audits. So I would like to ask, um, where do you think the audits should be uh, focusing? The input data, output data, or uh, the diversity of the teams uh, developing these systems, or what uh, would be my question? Thank you. Was that to anyone in particular? or um, To uh, anyone who wants to, but yeah, who wants to answer? <laughs> okay. Why don't we take KS's question, and then people can answer both as a final round? Yeah? Uh, I, um, uh, I thought this was going to be all about privacy, but uh, it, it's much more broad, so let me broaden it further. Uh, a quantum mechanic uh, scholar would say truth is in probability, not in uh, discrete cases. So, uh, I mean, you will not know whether this particular car will take 15 minutes to get to the Vault Hotel. But it can give a pretty accurate estimate of how many cars out of uh, 1,000 cars will get to the Vault Hotel in 20 minutes. Uh, I think uh, that's where the harvesting is taking place. Uh, of course, it will be inaccurate. I, I don't think it will ever be accurate to the uh, extent that you know, you are, uh, you know, on, uh, if, if you take the, uh, on, 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 on the, on the, your system of attitude or values, uh, I, I think people's expectations are much more uh, down to earth than, you know, than at a standard where, uh, uh, than, than, than before calling something bias uh, all other things, because uh, yes, I mean, I, I didn't talk about this in my presentation, but much of algorithmic bias can be countered by algorithmic affirmative action. I mean, if you think that uh, not giving, if, if you think that you are being too inhumane by not granting uh, loans to poor people, we can build into algorithm, we can hard code affirmative action type of code into your algorithm. Uh, so it, it is, uh, uh, I mean, some of the concerns raised by the uh, endless presentation and your pre presentation, I, I think we can be more optimistic than uh, some of you may think. As to privacy, as to uh, Internet of Things, uh, which is the main theme of, the, uh, theme of this event, um, Yes, things are sensors, but much of the data being collected by the sensors uh, are not, you know, if not shared by others, if it just remains in your, in your device, and if it is uh, circulated only around you, uh, can you call it a, I mean, is there a privacy concern there? For instance, if you have a, I mean, if somebody comes into your, bathroom while you are taking a shower, there's, there, there's, there will be privacy violation. But if a dog walks into your shower, do you call it a privacy violation? What if an inanimate object you know, is uh, you 
you know, like a bottle of soap is in your shower. You don't, you don't call it privacy. I mean, there's pri uh, there is no private concern there. So, you know, when you say things, right? I mean, you don't want to say things, but if the sensors, if, uh, uh, if the data is sufficiently, sufficiently controlled after being, hard, after being collected by the sensors and used for your benefit, uh, much of privacy concern can be reduced. I mean, disappear. Can I, can I start with it? Sure, Claudio. Yes, and that's, uh, um, we'll also answer her question with where do people think audit mechanisms could come from? So whoever wants to take that. Next. All right, I, I can touch that also. Uh, m let me just state that my, my concern here is, is essentially terminological, right? So I, I do not disagree that most of the times the sensors might collect data that is not sensitive at all. And in this case, a, a regular or a reasonable care concerning even data that is personal or data that is not personal at all can, can uh, very well uh, diminish our concerns uh, about that. But I do think that from an industry standpoint, but bottom line is this is not a flaw. This is a feature. The choice to call internet of choice is the, the, of, of internet of the, to call the environment to call the uh, this this ecosystem as Internet of Things. It's not a flaw. It doesn't happen by chance. It is chosen in a way that it goes seamless into people's lives, and then we mi might not at all times. Now we might be raising awareness to that, but in the beginning it was just the idea that some thing that was around you wouldn't have, the expression would take you to believe that this thing would not have the functionality of collecting data. If it does have that functionality and it collects data that is not sensitive or data that is not personal, I don't have any, any objection to that. But I, I like, to, I, by the way, I have lost that battle. But in the, the standard is there. No one is calling it anything else, right? I'm absolutely aware that I've lost this battle, but I, for a question of principle, I keep using the sensor idea and uh, highlighting the difference whenever I, I, I'm able to. To your question, I can at, at least start by, by saying that uh, it, it depends on, on the environment where, where you're applying or where you're trying to solve the problem. Uh, you have input data. You also have processing rules. If you're not talking about a machine learning algorithm that is too complicated and too organic to be examined, you could also, if you're looking at, at, uh, at a, a rather uh, descriptive and, and uh, uh, non-organic algorithm, you could still take a look at the processing rules. It is the case with many authorities that deal with competition, the data protection, when the algorithm is, uh, when the rules are possible or are, are auditable, it can happen. Or in the outputs, I would add, add the sensors as a fourth dimension to be examined, and it would depend on the realm or, or on the environment in which you're observing. Uh, and this, I think this is something that applies to the whole new discussion of AI and society. If you take a look at, at what, because all the people who made the, let's say, the, the recent, the most, the groundbreaking developments over the past years, they are all alive. They speak, they say things. So I think it's a good idea and a good opportunity to listen to what Jeffrey Hinton is saying, to what Yan Le Kun is saying, to, uh, to what they are, are, are saying now. If you, if you listen to their speeches and compare to the everyday uses of AI, you would say, what are the risks? Because in the end, it's, it's about risk management. What are the risks that a tool that processes natural language just so that it can show you on your, on your mobile phone? What are the risks that it poses? Very little. I would say there's no point in, in, in being too afraid or, or in, in reducing this use uh, of the systems. But what are they doing? Are they choosing uh, targets for, for the police? It's a different use. And the example I brought here to you, preempt, preemptive policing in the case, are they being used for preemptive policing? They themselves would tell you the systems are not mature enough for that yet. I don't know if they'll ever be. We know that there's a, there's a probabilistic question of, of a model, but then if I push you to the, next mod, uh, to the next example, which I mentioned here on the stage in the presentation, uh, does this, is this system able to select and engage a target 
and in case of a human life, take out this human life without the intervention, without a man in the loop, this brings another point. It's just not if the model acts right or wrong, it's about who, who you're going to have accountable for this action under international law. So we bring a new dimension. I would say that we could look at input data, output data, processing rules or sensors, depending on the case we're examining. Thank you. I think we could keep with this panel for a very long time, but I think there's such a high probability that all of you are hungry and I don't want to get in the way of lunch. So please join me in thanking our wonderful panel for a very diverse set of presentations.